Okay, so a lot of you probably don't know what I mean by this title, so hopefully you'll um, understand by the end of the introduction section. So you've seen before how we can use diagrams to reason about things, since in a few of the talks this week. Um, um, so, for example, if we have this uh, grey operation which has two inputs and one output, you can think of this as a multiplication of two inputs, and this suggests that it's uh, associative, and maybe you also have that as a unit, so the unit might be a grey node with zero inputs and one output, and this says it's a unit for it. And let's say we have another operation which is a white operation with one input and one output, and it satisfies these rules. So if we apply it after the grey unit, it's just the same as the grey unit, and if we apply it after the grey multiply, we can pass it through and have applied it before the two, uh, before the multiplication to go for the inputs. So this white operation is like an endomorphism on the grey operation. And then we piece of rewriting. So I take an example of the diagram. I can substitute things, so I can see that down here I have an exact copy of the same things there. So I can replace it with the left-hand side of that. And get a new diagram. And similarly I can do it again, so I now have a grey operation here which has two white inputs. So I can again replace it in the same way. So I can see here that I've now passed the white operation on the three inputs through to being a white operation on the output. In this case. So for this part, I'm looking at everything being commutative, so I'm assuming that the order of the edges on any node is not important. So if we look at this, I'm assuming that all three of these diagrams are exactly the same. They're all just a grey node with two inputs and one output. But that might not be the case, so that's the commutative version, but we might have a non-commutative version. So in this case, these three diagrams are all different. So we need to have some way of keeping track of which, which edges come in which order, so we need to keep a track of those. So we put a, a tip on each of the nodes. So I draw a tip on the left of each node here. Then I can now reference this uh, edge at the top as being the first edge clockwise from the tip. I can reference this one at the bottom as coming in second clockwise around the tip. And this one at the bottom right reference being the third one around the node. So I can now keep track of which edges are where. So this is a non commutative version. I can take the same theory and replace everything with non commutative nodes. But I'm excited to come to the last one. Because I can now keep track of the order on the nodes, I can put a, put a swap operation in here. So the inputs here are swapping order. So this is now the example of an anti-endomorphism. So we can pass white operations through the grey ones as long as we swap the order of the inputs. And again, I can substitute. So the same diagrams on the left. This time I replace it with this new version of the swap inside here. And then again, I can apply the same operation again this new diagram. So we can see here that I've passed these white operations on the inputs through to a white operation on the output, where I've reversed the order of all of the inputs. So I might wonder if I can generalise this. I've shown that I can pass white nodes through two of these grey nodes. What if I had an arbitrary number of grey nodes in a row, in a chain? So let's try and work with some families of diagrams. So rather than just one diagram at a time, we can have we can define a new node, this grey node, with an arbitrary number of inputs and one output, and we define it to be this tree of these grey multiply operations. And the question I asked before of whether I can pass a white operation through is now written like this. So if I have this arbitrary number of inputs to a grey multiply, and then I apply the white, these are the same as if I apply the white to all the inputs and then multiply them. That's not very formal with these ellipses, it's not clear what that actually means. So we use bang boxes to make this more formal. So we replace that with this new version. So a bang box is a blue square around a region of a, a diagram, a graph, which um, lets you repeat in that section. So here I'm allowed to repeat the input to the grey node any number of times, as long as I have the same number of copies of this uh, input going through white into the grey on the right hand side. So to understand this, we need to go get, have a way of getting from this bang box equation to the concrete equations again. So we deal using two operations. They are kill. So kill deletes the bang box and all of its contents, including all wires going into or out of the bang box. And the second operation is expand. So expand makes a new copy of whatever's inside the bang box. So here it's made a new copy of this input wire, still going into the gray. And on the right hand side, it's made a new copy of this uh, input going through white. 
plug it into the grate. And so we see that we have a new bang box equation, so I can keep going, I can kill again, expand, keep killing, expanding. So this equation here represents an infinite family of equations, all showing you that you can pass white operations through any number of these grey, any, any arbitrarity grey. No. So we call these bang graphs, they've been around for a while. So now let's imagine we have a different idea. So now we're looking at the non-commutative version of this. So I'm going to take the same equation I have here, and I'm replace all these nodes with the non-commutative version. So I can still define my operations. I can define kill in the same way. It just removes the bang box and all contents. But now when I want to expand, it's a bit more difficult, because I, I earlier just said that I make a new copy of what's inside the bang box and add it onto the grey node. But now I have an order on the grey node, it decides where to add it. Do I add it so that it's in the second position here, or do I add it so it's in the third position here? So to decide that, we can add some extra notation to our diagram, and we do it using arcs. So this red arc here tells me that when I copy this on expand, this bang box, the new copy of this point should be attached in to the right here, or anti-clockwise around the node. And this one tells me that when I make a new copy of this bang box, this edge will be copied to one which is attached clockwise around the node instead. So let's see what that looks like. If I expand, I get a new copy of the contents of this box and this box. In this case, it's attached anti-clockwise around the node. And in this case, it's attached clockwise around the node. So we can see that adding these arcs given us a way to, uh, to let things twist inside a diagram. Here is because we have one of our arcs going anti-clockwise and one going clockwise. That means we have this twisting property. And again, I can continue to kill and expand. And we can see that this equation represents an infinite family of equations, each one allowing us to pass white, no, white operations through grey as long as we swap the order of the inputs. So we call these bang tensors. We'll see why that name comes up later on. Now, working with diagrams like this gets quite difficult when you get a lot of them, so a program called Quantumatic was made a while ago and Quantum Derive. Uh, they allow you to input a set of axioms for your system, and then you can draw in your diagram and either let it do some rewriting for you and try and simplify your diagram, or you can do it yourself. You can search for the operation of the possible uh, rewrites. So in this case, I have a diagram here, and it's telling me that there's an option to do a red merge. <coughs> what that does is it takes these two red nodes and merges them together, so they become one on the right-hand side. Uh, and there's various other things this can do. We can also, we can output the graphical proof to LaTeX afterwards, which is great if you're trying to write a paper, it just involves graphical proofs. So it's clearly a very useful thing. So let's see what we have so far. We have two formalisms, bang graphs and bang tensors. Bang graphs are kind of limited, they require that everything commutes, whereas bang tensors allow non commutivity. I'm slightly biased, bang tensors are migration. Um, so bang graphs are combinatoric in nature. We'll see that later on when we see what they're actually what they're, say, what they're um, represented by. So it's a case of vertices and edges between vertices, which is combinatoric. Whereas bang tensors have a syntactic notation, which we'll again see on the next slide. Uh, bang graphs are automated by quantumatic, but the problem is that bang tensors are not automated, and this makes us angry. <laughs> so, let's not try and solve this talk. <laughs> so, um, we have two solutions to this. One solution would be to write all, rewrite everything from scratch. So, I could come up with a program which uses the, syn the syntax for bank tensors and has rewriting for that syntax. Um, that would be very efficient, but it involves rewriting all of this code that already exists, which would be quite annoying. So, that's not a bad option. We feel a bit indifferent about that one. Um, so the, the better way would be to use the code that already exists in Quantumatic and see if we can adapt it in some way. If we can add some extra data and maybe add some constraints in a way which um, means we can adapt the current version to work with bank tensors. And as you might expect, we're exciting. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's uh, go through what bank tensors are, what bank graphs are, so we can actually understand the mapping. So, so an example of a bank tensor. So we, we can store bank tensors as expressions. So once an expression which represents this diagram, so first of all, we've got this grey node, so we decide the grey node is represented by the letter psi. 
Uh, so write down, down the subside and then write down the edges in order clockwise, so it's F, A, B. And we add a hat to all the outputs and a check to all the inputs to show what's an output, what's an input. So there's one example. We add another node to this diagram, a white node. So now it's white node, so it's represented by phi, and it has edges A out, B out, C in, D out, E in. But then we contract over repeated names. So we can see that A appears twice on the right hand side. So we contract, and that means that they're plugged into each other. And similarly, B is repeated, so they contract. Uh, they get plugged into each other on that side. So we can see that this does allow us now to have this uh, swapping property of uh, edges. To extend this, bit, extend this bit more, so we now have a bang box. If we put a bang box around the top part. On the right hand side, represent this by putting uh, square brackets around the nodes which this includes. So put the square brackets around this node and the superscript B. And then remember, we need to have some way of knowing which way to expand these. So we put arcs on these edges. So here we've got an arc going anti clockwise. So that tells me that when I make a new copy of this edge, it gets added in here, so it's earlier in the clockwise order. So we need to have it expanding out to the left, so the new version is added here. So we draw that as a box pointing to the left of superscript A, B. Uh, so this one, maybe the second edge we have going clockwise. So we add that as a clockwise right pointing uh, box under B. And we can see how we can swap the orders, swap the directions of these. Swapping an arc is the same as swapping which direction we point. There's also more things we can do. We can actually combine these two edges and have them both expand together going uh, anti-clockwise. So I can draw that as a single arc of both edges. And that means that the single box pointing left contains both A and B. So this is what we call a bank tensor expression. And there are multiple different expressions representing any one bank tensor. We can see here that A and B don't even appear on the left hand side, but they appear on the right because they're bound. Let's compare this with a bang graph formalism. So for a bang graph, I want to represent this as a graph. So I can represent each of these nodes as node vertices. But now it's a bit weird. I want to try and represent these edges over here. But not really edges. So we're allowed to have these kind of half open edges which have an input which is cut off. So that's actually, we call them wires. So wires are allowed to have open ends. So to store these, we um, add some dummy vertices, which we call wire vertices. At least one for each wire, and they show you where the wires connect to the other nodes. So we put a wire vertex at the bottom here, which allows this to be now a graph formalism. This is now a typed graph. If I add a bang box to part of this, say around this section, again, I want it to be a part of a graph here, so I add it as a box vertex. So the new type of vertex called the box vertex, which I add, and I put an edge going to everything inside that bang box. So in this case, not only this node gets copied by B, but also the wire connecting it to anything else. So the wire needs to have an edge coming from B as well. I don't have much time to explain uh, nesting, but we're allowing, we're allowing uh, bang boxes to be nested inside each other, so B can be nested inside a bigger bang box, A. That means that when A gets expanded, a new version of B is created. So if we try and add this on the right hand side, we add a, a new box vertex A, with lines going to everything its con contents, including a line going to B, because B is copied by A. We also add loops, loops onto each one of these. Um, that's just uh, to mean that we can require that this is a post set to the uh, structure on the bank boxes. We don't want to have A nested inside B nested inside A. It doesn't make any sense. So we'll see what, uh, let's look at a, a node in a bank tensor form and see if we can try and represent this as a bank graph so that we're trying to encode it in automatic. So I try and write that as a bank graph, I can write it as a node vertex three wire vertices around the outside and a box vertex. But we can see we've lost some of the information. So I've lost, first of all, I've lost the tip. So I have no idea which one of these I consider to be the first edge, second edge, and third edge. Also, I've lost the expansion direction. I don't know which way to expand when I make new copies of this. So I'll try and find a way of adding that data back in to these diagrams. So if we look at the bang tensor expressions, we can see that that information is all stored in these parts here, in these subscripts. This is where it tells us what order A, B, C, D, and E are and which order they expand under B. So maybe I can add this, which I call edge terms, add one of these edge terms back into my diagram here, which allows me to store that information. So this tells me that A is the first one going out. It tells me it goes clockwise with respect to B, 
and it tells me that B is the next one going out and the C goes in. There's actually too much information here, I have got these hats and checks on B and A, B and C, but it's clear from the diagram which way they're going, so I can actually drop those a bit to make it a bit nicer. So now I have a different example of a bank tensor. So it looks almost the same, but it has a B is now considered to be the first edge, and then A. Um, then I can see that this represents as a graph. It looks the same as the one above. But adding this extra data in, we can see it's now not the same. So hopefully this will help us store band tensors as band graphs. We just need to add this neighborhood order thing, we call this. Add a neighborhood order to each one of our nodes inside a band graph. So this is the main point of the uh, paper. So I want to try and find this uh, function i, which takes this. So this is a band tensor. Let's uh, choose a representation for it. This is a band tensor expression representing this band tensor. So this means we've got names A, B, and C for each of these internal edges here. So I'll draw them on there. So my function, which encodes this as a band graph, takes each one of these uh, nodes and represents them in their band graph version. So just as a single node vertex and a single wire vertex for each of the edges around the outside along with the neighborhood order of this, saying that A should be the first, and then B should be second, and C should be third. So similarly, I can apply this to this second node here. So this white node becomes a single node vertex with Y vertices. Uh, so I've drawn C in the same place as C here, and B in the same place as B here. But we can see from the diagram, at least B has to be the first edge around here. So when I add a neighborhood order, we can see that that's stored by the fact that B is first in this neighborhood order. So the twisting is no longer visible there, but it is stored inside these neighborhood orders. And the final vertex, just single uh, node vertex, which is gray with a single output D, and therefore the input order is clearly just D. But it's inside a bank box B, so we put a bank box B around that. And now we just combine all of these by taking the union, so the C's combined, D, uh, C, B, and D combined here, and the bank box is combined. So I have my map I, which encodes band tensors as band graphs with neighborhood orders. Not that much time, so the, the, I can do the uh, reverse direction as well. So I can take this, and I can take each one of these nodes. So this gray node becomes a non commutative gray node, and I can just make sure I keep track of which way these are. So A, B, and C, that's correct. The white node is a white uh, non commutative node. And now I need to make sure that this B, so here, should be the first edge in, and C be the second, so I now get this uh, swapping. And then D, see here, and therefore we're back to the same band tensor we started with. So we have an, I, an inverse, I inverse, which is a left inverse for our encoding map. So quick properties. So I've defined this I, which takes band tensor expression, and gives you back band graph plus neighborhood order. <coughs> There's also there's a theorem that says if two expressions represent the same uh, band tensor, so if G and H are two band tensor expressions representing the same band tensor, then I of G and I of H are also represent the same band graph. So this means that it's not important which expression I choose when I make this mapping, and hence I can uh, lift I to a function on band tensors instead of band tensor expressions. And the, the converse is also true, so if I of G plus I of H, then G plus H. So we have that the left inverse is well defined. And the final theorem, I'm trying to show that this is in some way structure preserving. So operations kill and expand should be the same on both sides of this. So if I imagine applying kill to a band tensor, a new band tensor, or kill to a band graph with neighborhood order, get a new band graph, neighborhood order, it should be that this diagram commutes. So if I turn this round, so I inverse instead, I can explain what this means. So if I have a band tensor, I can now encode it using I, apply operations in quantumatic, and then decode it again using I inverse, and I'm back to what I would expect to have. So as a quick summary, uh, the problem was what about the can't work with band tensors. So we took band tensor expressions, made them into band graphs, and then we added the edge data, edge term data back in, to get band graphs with neighborhood orders. I then lifted this to a function on band tensors, so it was structure preserving, and hence we can encode bound tensors in automatic. And this is the exciting point of the talk. And that means we have automated reasoning with non-commutative structures. Hence it's flashing. <laughs>
So we can celebrate. <laughs> data so that we, we can now store graphs with this neighborhood order on the nodes and um, just check that it's well defined so that it has the right, right, right edges going out and going into the right boxes. Um, but there's a lot of work to do in actually implementing the matching algorithms and uh, substitution algorithms to make sure they actually still work. It's very much like a work in progress paper, so there's still some stuff to do for the actual theory as well for the, uh, for the encoding part before implementing it. Any more questions? 